Number 10, Crying Wolf. The Gulf of Tonkin incident was a conflict between Vietnam and US forces in 1964. What's messed up about that is that two days later, it happened again. Actually it didn't, big prank. The second incident was fabricated by the US just to justify ramping up their presence in Vietnam. Sadly, it worked, as the next eight years in Vietnam would end up being a total snipe storm for the US, as they would encounter problems abroad and at home. Thank goodness this is the only time the American government would ever lie about anything ever again, right? This was officially declassified decades later. Number 9, Agent Orange. The world agreed not to use chemical warfare after the First World War, as it was extremely cruel and lethal. So you might be surprised that America used chemical weapons during the Vietnam War. Agent Orange, brought to you by the Dow Chemical Company, was a herbicide and defoliant dropped and sprayed from air vehicles to cut down the thick jungle brush. Viet Cong soldiers were excellent at living off the land and concealing themselves in the jungle. Bad guy hides in jungle, you remove the jungle. Makes sense. The chemical was extremely effective, but what's so messed up was the negative health side effects. Soldiers that were exposed to the chemical developed cancers years after the war. But what's even more crazy is how it affected the Vietnamese people. It created children with really bad health defects, and to this day, there are many people who live with ill side effects of Agent Orange. That's just not right, man. That's wrong. That is so wrong, dude. Number eight. French Indochina. The US was not the first superpower trying to tame Vietnam. Vietnam used to be called French Indochina, and it used to be a colony of France. And when they no longer wanted to be a part of that, France came down to give them a piece of their minds. But you can probably guess how that went considering the US was there 20 years later trying to do the same thing. While France was trying to keep a colony and the US was trying to stop communism from spreading to other countries, Vietnam was trying to fight for its independence. Which is ironic for America because that's how they became a country. And yes, I know that the communist movement in Vietnam wasn't great by any standards, but the regime America was trying to put in place was no better. As much as France would have liked to keep Vietnam, Times were changing, and there was no victory in sight, with or without American support. Number 7. Well, that escalated quickly. Up until 1967, the war was bad. But it was nothing compared to what was going to happen in 1968. In 1968, the Viet Cong launched the Tet Offensive, a massive military campaign designed to destroy the foreign invaders. All across the country, key targets were being attacked, and it seemed overnight that the war went from a 6 all the way to an 11. What's so messed up though is even though the VC did not achieve major victories, it was costing a lot of American lives. With the Viet Cong using the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the war not only escalated in Vietnam, but had reached neighboring nations like Cambodia. This had an effect on the war back home. The US thought and told people it would be a quick war. They had the advantage. But after the VC flexing their military might, it was clear that more US soldiers would be needed to win the war. Which some people were beginning to question in the first place. And as time went on, most people would protest America's involvement. Number 6. A Terrible Loss of Life The Vietnam War is one of the most important events in US history, and honestly world history too. It was a very hot war during the Cold War, which we could do a whole video on that itself. A time of superpowers ready to annihilate one another at the push of a red button. Thousands of young men volunteered or were drafted to fight in a war that would humble the very powerful country. 58,141 Americans would lose their lives in order to contain communism. Of that 61%, they were under the age of 21. That is an insane, I can't even believe that. The Vietnamese lost over 300,000 people in the conflict. The war is remembered for being a tragic loss of life, and the domino theory that communism would spread throughout the world if containment was not initiated didn't happen, as most countries today just aren't communist. Number five. Civil rights. If you know the 1960s, then you know it was a decade of change. A lot of history to unfold in just 10 years. Again, we could probably do a whole video on that. The Vietnam War is especially important towards the civil rights movement, as black Americans were a big part of the war effort in Vietnam. Black soldiers were nothing new to the American military, but their integration with white soldiers was. Every war previous, soldiers of different skin color were separated into different units. While most soldiers got along, there was still a long way to go, as black black soldiers were still often mistreated. It seemed, however, that in a war zone, white Americans and black Americans were fine, but at home, had tensions. 
We could do a whole video on civil rights and segregation, but to sum it up, racial relations made Americans ask questions. And for black Americans, the question is, how is someone expected to fight a war in a foreign country that we really have no business being in for a country that won't allow a certain group of citizens to even buy a cup of coffee because they're not allowed to enter the building due to the color of their skin? Just doesn't make sense, man. Number 4, Mattel 16. The 1960s saw a lot of technological development. The extensive use of the helicopter comes to mind. During the early years of the Vietnam War, Americans were issued a brand new rifle. The M16 was a brand new design that flopped as hard as it could, as it tended not to work. Which, if you're in a war, is kind of not what you want to happen. Your stuff's kind of got to work. A rumor had spread around that the firearm never needed to be cleaned, which in a jungle setting with mud and rain just doesn't make any sense. This, with already existing flaws, made it jam and was rendered useless by soldiers. Nicknamed the Mattel 16 after the toy company, some soldiers were forced to use enemy weapons, which sadly in some cases may have led to fatal incidents of friendly fire. Number 3. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Another very useful tool in destroying the Vietnamese jungle, trees are made of wood and wood burns, so set them ablaze. Except napalm is different. A chemical compound meant to burn at a very hot temperature of 5000 degrees Fahrenheit and it would burn for a while. This was used in multiple ways, but probably the most effective with airstrikes. While not the first time firebombing had been used, as it was proven effective in the firebombing of Japan during World War II, the Vietnam War saw almost the same amount of ordnance dropped, napalm and others included, as used in all of World War II by America. That is an insane statistic. It had a terrible effect on people, as it can burn skin off. The most infamous picture from the Vietnam War had something to do with this. We can't show it to you, but you've probably honestly seen it already. The military would later disband its use, as the ability to control napalm's destructive power is limited. Number 2. GI Kebab While the Viet Cong may not have won many battles against the US, they were still formidable fighters. They had the lay of the land and laid traps everywhere. From 1965 to 1970, 11% of American casualties were related to Viet Cong placed traps. What's so messed up in that is that in a modern war with modern technology, a lot of the traps the Viet Cong were using were something out of the Stone Age, but still deadly. Improvised explosives, swinging spike balls, trip wires, single shot cartridges, and snake pits right out of Indiana Jones. I can't even believe that's real. But the most effective were punji pits or punji sticks. A large hole is dug and bamboo spikes are placed at the bottom. Then, out of pure evil, urine or human excrement is put on the spikes. A thin layer of leaves or cover is placed on the trap, so when someone comes along they would fall in a pit of spikes that if that didn't kill them, an infection from the waste would, or make recovery very, very miserable. That is just, that is cruel, man. That is, that ain't right, man. That ain't right, Chief. Number one, Apocalypse Now. Tiger Force was a long range reconnaissance unit that later became known for its acts of war crimes. Not sure if there could be war crimes when everyone's doing naughty things, but okay. To quote Martin Sheen in Apocalypse Now, charging someone with murder around here is like handing out speeding tickets at the Indy 500. And like a scene right out of that movie, the members of Tiger Force had a tradition to make necklaces out of ears. I'm going to say that again. They made necklaces out of ears. There are a number of things Tiger Force committed that are honestly just not safe for life. But that's war at the end of the day. War as hell. Number 10, the war to end all wars. All right, hear me out. Everyone knows about World War I, but that doesn't mean it wasn't weird. World War I was probably one of the weirdest wars to ever be fought, technologically speaking. To put this into perspective, the first successful flight of airplanes was by the Wright brothers. It had only been done five years prior. World War I is also noted for the first use of tanks, chemical weapons, just to name a few party favors. But perhaps the weirdest thing about World War I was the use of old war tactics against new war tech. It was quickly discovered that running directly into machine gun fire is bad for your health. Number 9. Just say no. Honestly, just a classic move. Great Britain being broke needed a new revenue stream. In total Pablo Escobar style, the British forced their way into China where they fought a war and China was forced to cede over Hong Kong and other ports along with letting Britain come in there and just sell all this delicious opium. It's weird because this is a similar tactic to what you'd see with cartels and gangsters. Not a country. If old Ronald Reagan knew what was really happening during the opium wars, he'd be rolling around in his grave. 
Just say no, kids. Number eight, the pig wars. This is so weird, it could only be real. So here's the rundown. After America had beaten Britain in the Revolutionary War, it was time for Manifest Destiny, expanding westward. The British were doing the same thing. They got to the Pacific West Coast, and everything was cool, except for some islands not too far from the mainland. It was heavily debated on who owned these islands. Surely this can be resolved without conflict. Yes, it can be, and don't call me Shirley. Well, it almost turned into another global war, actually. Both Americans and British were living on the island, and when a British-owned pig had gone one step too far and eaten out of an American field, that pig paid the price with his life, causing tensions to escalate to the point where the Navy and high-ranking officers got involved, partially being stoked by an American who, to this day, no one knows the method to his madness, but was honestly just looking for a fight regardless. What a crazy guy. Shot a pig, we're gonna start a war. Number seven, the Anglo-Zanzibar War. Never heard of this one, I bet. And as a comedian, I can appreciate the comedic value of this war. Not that wars are funny, but trust me, you'll see. The Anglo-Zanzibar War was a military conflict fought between the United Kingdom and the Zanzibar Sultanate on the 27th of August, 1896. Good year. What's very unusual about this war is its length. No, not because it's still happening today in a technicality like the Korean War, but rather how quick it ended. The conflict lasted about 40-45 minutes. The British Navy began a cannonade at 9am and had destroyed a large amount of the Zanzibar force by 945, leaving only one British sailor injured. The leader of Zanzibar made his escape, and the British officially moved in. Brutally moved in as well, actually. It was an occupation, it wasn't good. Number six, for the Emperor. This one is my personal favorite on the list, as it's a story too crazy to believe, but it is very true. Strap in for this one, folks. What do you call it when the war you were fighting ended 25 years ago, but the enemy still thinks it's on? Yep, that's right. If you don't know, this actually happened, and while not a new war per se, it is technically their own little war. What I'm referring to is the Japanese holdouts of the Second World War. In the Pacific Theater of War, Americans adopted a strategy called island hopping, which basically saw Marines clear out dug in Japanese forces all throughout the many islands of the Pacific. When one was cleared out, they would move on to the next, and so forth, and so forth. Except, the thick jungles of these islands are good at hiding things. More specifically, hiding Japanese soldiers who continued to fight World War II, even though it was over years prior. Every few years or so, more soldiers would come out of hiding and surrender. But the most extreme case being Hiro Onoda, who was fighting the war for almost 30 years from 1944 to 1974. During his time hiding, he raided and unalived local Filipino farmers. Next time you go to the jungle, just be careful. You don't know who's out there. Always watching, Mike Wazowski. I'm always watching. Number five, Mad Jack Churchill. Again, not exactly its own war, but uh, Buddy here was fighting his own war, basically. Meet Mad Jack Churchill, a British commando who went into battle with a sword and bagpipes. I'm gonna say that again for the people in the back. Went into a modern war with modern weapons using a sword and bagpipes. When asked about his medieval ways, Jack replied with, Any officer who goes into action without his sword is improperly dressed. To add to this already insanity that is Mad Jack Churchill, he holds the record, or title, for the last recorded longbow kill in history. That's insane. When in 1940, a poor German soldier met the business end of Jack's barbed arrows. His military career was very impressive, having become a commando and escaping capture from Germans later in the war. He would then marry his wife and stay with her happily ever after for 55 years. That, why is there not a movie of that guy yet? There should be a movie of that guy. Number four, the football war. Everyone loves football. And next on the World Cup is coming home. Okay, bad impressions aside, this war is over football. but well, sort of. It does have a little to do with land and agricultural disputes between Honduras and El Salvador. The dictator of Honduras at the time began to use El Salvadorians as a scapegoat, which made tensions sour between the two Central American countries. As it turns out, it was time for the 1970 World Cup, and they were facing each other. But after some classic sabotage by both teams, tensions got even worse, as Honduras began to crack down on immigrant farmers from El Salvador. They'd had enough. Cut all diplomatic ties and declared war. Sometimes referred to as the 100 Second War since it was so short, but sadly thousands of people died and it didn't really solve anything. 
But we still got football though, right? Come on, everyone loves football. Number three, the Falklands War. If you look at the globe and take a look at the very southern tip of South America, then slightly east of that, you won't see very much. And that's because there isn't very much there. However, what is there is a very small island called the Falklands. It was colonized by Britain, France, and Spain in the 1700s, but because it was so far away, it wasn't really a top priority for any of the imperial powers. Everyone kind of had more important stuff going on. Well, fast forward a few hundred years and now Argentina wanted a piece of the action. Thinking taking the islands was going to be a cakewalk, Argentine forces took over. Britain, feeling like Argentina didn't respect the holy playground rule of dibs since they left a plaque on the island stating that it was theirs, went to war. A war which sadly did cost a few hundred lives. Today it's remembered for its losses and the leadership of Iron Lady Margaret Thatcher. Number 2. The enemy of mine enemy is my friend. This is just too weird not to mention. May of 1945 was just a bad time to be a German evil mustache man. Actually, he was kaput, but the war still raged on. The weirdest battle of the month would have to be the Battle of Castle Itter. High value French prisoners were being held in a castle that had been transformed into a prison. A small American force approached the castle when the Germans were spotted. The Germans immediately surrendered and then offered to aid the Americans in liberating the French prisoners. Yep, that's right. Trouble is, there was a German SS force that wasn't going to let that happen. So, it was Americans and Germans versus some naughtier Germans. And after an intense firefight, the joint force would be victorious and the prisoners freed. Number 1. Second Rate Ostrich Any remaining Jedi will be hunted down and defeated. Any collaborators will suffer the same fate. I don't, that was terrible. Anyway, sorry, that's my Palpatine side coming through. Sorry about that guys. This is going to be the weirdest thing you're going to hear all week. Okay, I'm willing to bet most of you folks at home have never heard of the Emu War. Which may be because the Aussies don't want you to know about it, as it is a little embarrassing. But basically this is how it went down. The Great Depression sucked for everyone. Australia was hit rather hard as they relied on agriculture exports. People just weren't buying. To make matters worse, there was an abundance of pests destroying crops. The worst of these crop eaters are knockoff ostriches, emus. So many emus are running amok that the farmers asked the military for help. The military, not wanting to mess around, obliged by sending a couple of men with two Lewis machine guns. When the pack of bloodthirsty emus was shot at, they ran away. And only a small number were killed. This happened multiple times, so much so that it was jokingly said that the emu should receive medals for their valor. Of an estimated 20,000 emus wrecking havoc, only about a thousand were terminated. The army also spent a lot of machine gun rounds for this operation. So, in a nutshell, the emus kinda won. Yikes. Kicking off the list at number 10, a day in the life. So as soon as the sun came up, your life as a Civil War soldier began. You would train day in, day out, preparing for battle. It was important that each soldier knew their role to work together as a unit. Now, I would say that there's no time for fun and games, but they always made time to blow some steam off. In between drills, soldiers would do chores just like we do every day. They would cook meals, do laundry, clean gear, and make sure that everything is smooth. Passing the time was done by playing dominoes or poker. Reading was of course a popular way of passing the time as well, but it was a lot harder to get your hands on a book back then, especially when you're running around between marches and battles. So more often than not, soldiers would trade newspapers with their opponents. You would hear about the Christmas peace treaty, but this would happen as well, they would just trade papers. A soldier named Milton Barrett stationed in the 18th Georgia Volunteers wrote about this back in 1863. He said, our regiment had just come off picket. We stood close together and could talk to each other. Then when the officers were not present, we exchanged papers and bartered tobacco for coffee. They would do it when the officers weren't looking. That's the most intriguing part. They would manage this by using a small boat. Tricky, always away. The first aerial photograph was back in 1860. James Wallace Black took this photo, not by using drones or any bowling alley crazy technology we have today, but rather just a hot air balloon. This lovely landscape is the town of Boston and you're looking at it from 2,000 feet. This was a long time before selfie sticks. Even longer before that, hot air balloons were being used in warfare. The first account of a hot air balloon being used was 19... The first account of a hot air balloon being used in war was 1794, when the French Committee of Public Safety created the Corps d'Astrosiers, which is a hot air balloon squad. They were used in the Battle of Charleroi and Fleurus, and then 70 years later, they were used in the American Civil War. 
They were pretty large as well, they could fit around five guys, where smaller balloons like the Eagle and Excelsior only carried one soldier. Those were for stealth flights. That'd be pretty brave. Imagine seeing a hot air balloon coming over the horizon and it has soldiers shooting at you. That's incredible. I, I didn't hear about any of this growing up. They could reach up to a thousand feet, so they definitely had a vantage point like no other, and they would communicate with soldiers on the ground using flag signals or, of course, telegraphs. The most successful balloon program in the Union was under the command of Thaddeus Lowe. He and Lincoln were allies, and Lowe actually sent a telegraph to Lincoln once describing the view of Washington from above. Call your friends more and describe your view to them. You might get a few things done. Number eight, bounty jumpers. Fewer than 150 Union soldiers were killed for desertion, and Lincoln was actually constantly writing letters and endorsements reducing soldier sentences from death to labor during the war. That's how bad it got. Deserters were a big problem for both the Confederate and Union armies, so it was punishable by death. After the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Union had 100 deserters roughly a day. That's a lot, every single day. The Union actually used peer pressure at one point just to keep soldiers from leaving. In 1863, the Union offered regiment perks if a certain percentage of original men were on for a following tour of duty. So soldiers inside were making others stay on board. How they did that, what they said, we don't know. Bounty jumpers were men who were paid to fill on the spot of newly drafted soldiers. So these guys would join for a few days and then desert them all over again and join a new post as the new substitute and get paid. And of course, some deserters were branded to avoid this problem. Number seven, daily diet. These soldiers were all around 25 years old. The minimum age to join, of course, was 18, but a lot of these guys who were that young would often lie about their age anyways on paper. So on paper, the average was 25 years. But these guys were kids, basically. They ate mostly crackers. And when I say crackers, I don't mean the salty work snacks that you have today. These were made of like flour and water and just salt called hardtack. They would eat berries, nuts, and fruits, anything they could find is all they had. Most of these soldiers were close to starving to death. Number six, soldiers protest. One third of the Union soldiers were immigrants, and one in 10 were African American. And those soldiers actually refused their salaries for 18 months to protest being paid lower wages than white soldiers. When black soldiers were signing up in the Union Army in 1863, they were only getting $10 a month, while white soldiers were getting around $13 a month. Officers were getting $700 a month too. It was just insane. To make things even worse, black soldiers were then hit with a $3 monthly cleaning fee, bringing that down to $7 a month now. So a protest was in order and it was held for 18 months, and then come September 1864, black soldiers received equal pay that was retroactive to their enlistment date. So they finally were able to send money back to their families after that long. Number five, passing time. You would assume the Civil War and being part of it and everything I've talked about would give you enough anxiety, but gambling was also a common pastime in between battles. And when I say gambling, I don't mean, okay, it's nighttime, let's throw a few bucks down and play dominoes. No, they would gamble on everything. Horse races, chess, euchre, poker, checkers, cards were popular until the end of the Civil War when, of course, they were harder to come by, being so flimsy and all. And when dominoes and cards were out of the picture, soldiers would really go old school and play leapfrog. Yeah, games like that were literally all they had. They would wrestle each other for fun, they would have foot races and bet on them. Bowling would be played using cannonballs to knock down wooden pins. And baseball was also played, but it was a little different back then to how we remember it now. The ball was a lot softer, and there was sometimes only two bases. The only way you were out also was if you were hit by the ball, hence the softness that I mentioned. Number four, coldest winters. With the winter winds rolling in occasionally, soldiers could no longer play baseball outside and peg each other with baseballs. But what you could do was hit each other with snowballs. A little fun, also a little scary. They called it a snow battle. Yeah, a snow battle too. Battle, way more intense. Soldiers would leave with bruises, black eyes, and sometimes even broken bones. Yeah, these guys were blowing off lots of steam and they would plan attacks and take it obviously seriously, as they did with their daily civil duties. Even officers got in on this action. When pieces of ice were no longer available to large units to throw at one's head, other winter games would include skating and sledding. Number three. Food march. In April 1863, a group of mostly women led a march to get the governor's attention. The governor at the time, John Letcher, was joined by President Jefferson Davis. It did not end well. The food situation in the South was not great because food prices changed depending on the status of the war. Outcomes of the battle directly affected prices because they were linked to the CSA's currency. That plus the fact that invading troops from the North would often burn crops when they came through, it was getting worse over time. Come April 1863, this march of women broke windows. They flipped carts until eventually they drew out Governor John Letcher and President Jefferson Davis. John Letcher literally started to throw cash at the protesters. Now, they still didn't stop, obviously, that didn't solve problems. It was so bad that the militia almost had to open fire. Number two, 
the alligator. I mentioned soldiers and hot air balloons, so I must mention the United States Navy's first submarine. How fun. This 47 foot long submarine that was paddle powered, yep, you heard me, paddle powered, so you'd be inside and just, you would do this. We can't call it the USS Alligator because it technically didn't see any active days of combat. In fact, the Alligator, that's what I'll call it, had to be cut loose on its first mission. It was being towed behind the USS Sumter on April 2nd, 1863, right off North Carolina when bad weather hit. The Alligator went down and we haven't found it since. It's still out there. The Alligator is still lurking out there. Only a few months after this new weapon went down, the Confederate States of America launched their own sub, the H.L. Huntley, and it sank the USS Housatonic near the coast of Charleston, officially marking the first time a submarine sank an enemy ship. It also immediately sank afterwards, taking the lives of eight crewmen, so even in victory, you're not safe. They made history, but only enjoyed it for minutes. This is all tragic. Number one the wage gap. Hundreds of women joined the Civil War and they did so by looking like men. Yeah, they would pull a she's the man and get to work. But the thing is, like I mentioned before, with the CSA's currency being affected by the status of the war, soldiers were getting $13 a month roughly. That's double what a woman could make anywhere on the planet, so they really had no choice but to join. This was long before women's suffrage, so if they thought you were a man, you could use that $13 how you wanted. So it comes to no surprise that women would keep this disguise even after the war ended. In 1909, the US Army officially denied that any woman was ever enlisted in the military service of the United States as a member of any organization of the regular or volunteer army at any time during the period of the Civil War. During the Civil War though, that was the first time in American history when women all came together in a war effort. Thousands of women from the North and South volunteered as nurses. Number 10, not till the fat lady sings. Most people would be delighted to know that a war is over. War sucks, it's expensive, costs lives, and uh, come on man, it just sucks. Officially, North and South Korea have not signed a peace treaty. That's right. Although they both agreed to an armistice in 1953, on solid paper, there's no surrender, which technically means they're still at war. This sounds bad, but it can't be, right? Not as if tensions between these two could ever be high. It's not as if they're scheming of ways to undermine each other and just waiting for an excuse to open the biggest can of whoop ass at a minute's notice, right? Everything's fine. I don't know if everything's fine. Number nine, up and down. The Korean War was a great military success and everyone went home happy. Very nice, great success. Uh, just kidding, actually. It didn't really solve anything. What's so messed up is everyone just kind of ended up where they started. North Korea had pushed into the south, almost making it all the way south, when the very effective UN organized a police force of multiple nations, mostly US, and punched their way back up to the 38th parallel. But maybe we better go further, ballsy General MacArthur Douglas said to himself, admiring his own reflection in the mirror, pushing their way all the way up to the Chinese border, where 250,000 Chinese soldiers helped the UN force by pushing them back down to the 38th parallel. Putting everyone in the same position they were in the beginning. It's almost as if war was a pointless cost of life. Nah, that can't be, right? No. Number eight, nuclear threequel. This one is kind of scary, honestly. So during the Korean War's impression of snakes and ladders, game of borders, and front lines changing like the wind, General MacArthur was getting frustrated with the progress, or lack thereof. He wanted a quick solution. Something that would bring a swift end to the conflict, all while flexing a little muscle in the process. Being a big fan of how the US annihilated two cities in Japan in the previous war, he proposed that America once again just start dropping nukes fallout style. While this was being considered, it was ultimately a no cal zone situation, as I like to call it, for the US and the UN. Soviet Russia had just figured out the recipe for nuclear bombs and would not hesitate to send one their way in return. The US had lost its nuclear monopoly and ushered in the age of mutually assured destruction. And thank God they didn't to be honest. I love playing the Fallout games, but that doesn't mean I actually want to be in them. Nah thanks man, I, I'm good. I'm good dude. Number 7, I need a hero. When we all tell stories, we like to tell stories with heroes and villains, beginnings, middles, ends, rising actions, climax, and conclusion. Bad guy hurts good guy, good guy perseveres, and he beats bad guy. Credits roll as the hero walks off into the sunset. Now I'd like to tell you that the Korean War was a tale of good versus evil. But it's more like bad versus evil. Korea was split between Communist North, supported by China and the Soviet Union. The South was supported by the UN and the US. Each has their own dictator wanting to unify Korea in their own image. 
Yes, the communists were not very nice, but the right wing dictator installed by the US was arguably just as bad. So in short, a super awesome time to be in Korea. Number 6. Tootsie Slide this one goes out to all the fans of MacGyver, you're gonna love this one. So during a very cold segment of the Korean War known as the Chosen Mountain, nicknamed Frozen Chosen by the very cold marines that were stationed there, temperatures were below negative 25 degrees celsius and morale was lower, well actually their ammo count was. So the marines radioed in an airdrop for Tootsie Rolls, which was just a code name they would given to mortar shells. Apparently the radio operator receiving this message did not understand this. And the actual chocolate candy Tootsie Roll was airdropped to the Marines instead. Yeah. Not wanting to waste this processed American delicacy, Americans went full MacGyver and discovered that once chewed and placed in bullet holes or in things that needed to be filled, the treat made for a decent enough repair. If women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. Number 5. Stranger Danger We all know if there's a van that rolls up to your neighborhood and there's a man inside offering free candy, it's gonna be a bad time. Well, North Korea might have had the biggest and baddest van in the neighborhood, as it's estimated that 84,000 people were kidnapped during the war. That is so many people. Why was North Korea putting so many faces on the side of milk cartons, you ask? Well, it was mainly a force repopulation tactic, which again is so messed up, I can't even begin to tell you how wrong that is, but also may have been the beginning of a super secret spy program, where North Korea was interested in having biracial spies, making it easier to infiltrate the enemy. Just one of many nefarious activities North Korea has been up to. There is no spy program in North Korea and I, I am not saying, I, I am absolutely saying this of my own free will. Please do not send help. Number 4. Not actually a war. While there were a lot of bang bang shooty shooty killy killy during the Korean war, technically it wasn't really a war even though it feels like one. Being referred to as a police matter, yeah, the US sent a lot of troops to fight this not war, which in case you're wondering how that's possible, you can take a look at Congress, as Congress never declared war, setting a new precedent. Although after the millions of dollars spent, the loss of thousands of soldiers on each side, plus the UN force being comprised of 16 other nations, I'm not exactly sure how it's not a war, that's like me saying. I did not do my English essay because it's not an English essay. It's a two page opinionated piece that should be four pages, but I didn't read the book and just use cliff notes. Sorry Mrs. M. I mean come on, can you blame me? Have you ever actually tried to sit down and read Lord of the Flies? Not in a school setting? I called the chief last night, you know what, he said it wasn't it. Number 3. Top Gun Ask any military history guru or anyone who's got a thing for it and they will tell you that after World War II military tech was about to get a little crazy. On September 8, 1950 something a little spicy happened in regards to both military and aviation history. The world's first all jet dogfight took place. Americans in F-80s and communists piloting the infamous MiG. Despite a movie that I actually think isn't very good, this wasn't great for the Americans. Yes, they did end up shooting down the enemy, but it was clear that the MiG was outperforming the F-80. Forced American aviation to come up with something just a little bit better. Come on guys, you can do it. Number 2. Just in case. So it's been years since the Korean War. They've been split in half, DMZ is there, everything's kosher right? Well, not exactly. If you follow the news in recent years, you know that North Korea has been doing some unsavory testing with ballistic missiles. However, what some people may not know, and it's kind of messed up when you think about it, is to this day there is still a large number of US soldiers stationed in South Korea, 30,000 to be exact. A remnant from the Korean War, but something that many would consider to be a necessity given the hostile nature of the North Korean regime. Hopefully things stay in a stalemate and don't escalate. We got enough problems on our hands right now. On a side note, there's also a large concentration of US soldiers in Japan as well. Not directly related to the Korean War, but they are in close proximity just in case uh, anything sneaky happens. Okay. Number 1. Big Boom Little Changes World War 1 changed lives. It dissolved century old empires, completely redrew the map. World War 2 doesn't happen without World War 1 and it was so bad, the whole world swore to never let that happen again. Heck, even wars from centuries ago had more cause and effect. 
The Korean War is very different in this regard. Like previously mentioned, the communists were bad, but the capitalists were not much better. While the lines may not be as blurred as some wars, the outcome was completely different to what most people were used to. When World War II ended, there was cheering in the streets. When the Korean War ended, there just wasn't much to show for it, besides a tragic loss of life, debt, and a new theory about communism that would literally make the exact same thing happen in Vietnam 15 years later. Seriously, the comparisons are uncanny. It's like the exact same thing. Number 10, live long enough to become the villain. Saigon isn't Saigon anymore, and while many great efforts were made to thwart the Viet Cong, the finger quote good guys lost. There's a little bit of irony in the story, however. Think about it for a second. America was a colony who fought a very hard battle for their independence against the most powerful foreign power at the time. Fast forward to the Vietnam War, and here they are trying to fight a war for independence against the most powerful foreign nation. Different in details, but mm, the same in broader terms. Sadly, it was a tragic loss of life on both sides, and while you always want to pick out the hero in every story, in war, it's not exactly black and white. More of a gray area. Number 9. No More Heroes Looking at photos of soldiers coming home from war, you'll see people hugging, cheering, laughing, kissing, and raising a glass to toast the return of their sons and daughters. There's a famous picture from VJ Day that you've probably seen as a sailor kissing in the streets. However, sadly for Vietnam vets, the return home was not with welcome arms, cheering crowds, or celebrating of any kind, really. The veterans were met with pretty much the opposite. Vietnam was the first war to ever really get the media coverage that it did. For the first time, Americans at home got to see what was going on. And it wasn't pretty. Over time, disapproval for the war grew to the point where it was protested and soldiers did not receive the care that they needed. As much as we'd like to mean nowadays with Vietnam flashbacks, these soldiers' mental health was not dealt with. PTSD, depression, and a country that didn't want them were very real for shell shocked men returning home. Number 8. One of many wars. Despite Walter Cronkite and Bob Hope's coverage of the war, and that's kind of a joke for people over the age of 60, Vietnam was a war in a series of armed conflicts during the Cold War. Yes, for Americans, it was the most memorable to say the least, but there were many hot wars that took place during the Cold War. I'm not really sure how it got that name, but okay. The Vietnam War was a byproduct of the Cold War, just like these other wars and conflicts. For example, the Ethiopian Civil War, the Ogden War, the Dominican Civil War, the Six Days War, just to name a few. Vietnam was the last time US forces would fully send troops on the ground like that for at least a few years. All the previous wars I mentioned were more the style of proxy wars. Basically, the United States and Soviet Union would vicariously fight to much smaller, less powerful nations. Basically, it's like getting your big brother to fight for your little brother. Number 7. Rainbow Chemicals Remember the last time when I talked about Agent Orange? Well, there was actually a whole rainbow of colored lethal chemicals used. Orange for trees, Agent Blue to destroy their rice supply, and a few other varieties and colors as well. They became known as the Rainbow Herbicides. The side effects of these chemicals were horrible, creating birth defects in children whose parents have been exposed. Many people still live with these conditions and unfortunately, children born today still have birth defects. Clearly this stuff is awful and should never be used again. I went to the chief's lab last night and he took a look at the chemicals and he said, that's not it. Number 6. Ho Chi Minh the man behind the madness, or at least the communist revolution that he so desperately wanted to take over. Born in 1890 in what was then Indochina, a French colony, his beginnings of being a leader and anti-colonial views started quite young after being expelled from a school for such beliefs. He eventually found his way to France in 1919, where the Treaty of Versailles claimed Vietnamese freedom. His pleas, however, were not heard. A Japanese occupation during World War II and a rise in communism in the East was slowly adding ingredients for a revolution stew. Weird metaphor, but let's run with it. France, wanting to take back their colony, had started the Vietnam War. Now in charge of the communist revolution, it would be a decades long fight with America and South Vietnam before claiming their bloody victory. Could have been prevented, that's crazy too. Like he went to France and he's like, give us freedom. They're like, no, sacre bleu, you go back to where you came from. Number five, helicopter war. Probably the most iconic iconography of the war is the Bell UH-1 Iroquois, or better known as the Huey. The Vietnam War was the first war to see extensive use of helicopters. And honestly, I'm not sure how Americans would have fought the war without them. One of the main reasons the Viet Cong were successful was because they knew the land. 
They knew the jungle and used many tactics to their advantage, oftentimes the jungle being their best weapon of defense itself. Even though chemicals and napalm were being used to help unjungle the jungle, it's the extensive use and effectiveness of the Huey helicopter that gave America the technological edge it so needed. For anyone that was actually there, I can just imagine the relief of soldiers that they must have felt when seeing those green beauties come barreling out of the sky. The helicopters turned out to be a great design and was used for many years after the Vietnam War. Number 4. Draft Dodging Grade 12, what a great time to be alive. You're about to graduate. All your friends are excited about spending one last summer together before everyone goes off to college. Maybe you'll spend some time down at the beach, go hang out at the mall, or maybe you'll find a summer fling at a summer party. Nice. And just as you were about to put those bell bottom jeans on, your mom says you got a letter. Oh no. You just got drafted into the Vietnam War, and it looks like you'll be spending your summer looking for a guy named Charlie in the jungle. That's weird, I wonder where he is. This was a reality for many young Americans who found themselves looking at a piece of paper that either meant they could die in a jungle or be in trouble with the law. However, when option A and B suck, go for C. In this case, that was draft dodging. Americans who received the mandatory volunteer letter fled in decently large numbers to other countries so Uncle Sam couldn't have his way. Many ended up here in Canada. Number three, Napalm Girl. I briefly touched on this in the last part, but Kim Fan T deserves a moment of her own. There's a picture that made it out of the Vietnam War known as Napalm Girl. Well, Kim is that girl. Again, we cannot show you the image due to its graphic nature, but it's basically screaming Vietnamese children running down the road after a napalm strike near their location. Unfortunately for Kim, she was an innocent victim of total war. Her clothes were burned off and her skin was severely damaged by napalm, leaving her with scars and reminders of a horrible past. Almost 50 years later, she's still around to tell the story and how she used faith and forgiveness to forgive those that caused so much pain and destruction to her country and herself. The photograph of Kim is probably the most infamous image of the war in maybe the 20th century and is a part of the media coverage that helped inspire Americans to pull out of the war. Number two. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Good old Tricky Dick had just become president, and he had a plan to end the war in Vietnam. But first, they had to invade Cambodia. Why Cambodia? Well, basically the Viet Cong had this genius idea of moving war goods, materials and troops on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but also moving through Cambodia, which at the time was neutral. The US just wasn't looking there at first, however, when it was realized it would be a tactical good decision to stop that from happening, for poor Tricky Dick, the invasion of Cambodia felt like he was furthering the war rather than trying to bring it to a close. To make matters worse, the Pentagon papers were leaked, and it was discovered that America had increased involvement and not decreased. The people had had enough, and anti-war movements sparked across the country. It wasn't too long after this that they pulled out of Vietnam and Cambodia. Number 1. The Music A lot can be said about the Vietnam War, but if sitting through history classes and watching some old movies doesn't paint the picture, then sit down and have a listen to the music that was made during the conflict. A lot to do with counterculture at the time, once the Vietnam War went into second gear, art began to have its take on the Far East conflict. Books, movies, plays, but nothing more reachable and mainstream as music. The Doors, Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, and the classic CCR. If your thoughts of Vietnam don't feature Fortunate Son by CCR, is it really a thought about Vietnam? I say no. This is kind of disturbing as when you compare it to music one decade prior, it's completely different. Despite baby boomers causing havoc on minimum wage retail workers today, their music is pretty good and does a good job of depicting the emotions felt in such a grim situation. Yes, I love the music. I, I love the music of the American people. <laughs> Number 10, the Pig Wars. If there's one thing Americans love besides Dunkin' Donuts, I mean, I'm, I'm just assuming because your commercials tell me that America runs on Dunkin's. If it's not that, it's Manifest Destiny. It seems the second the Founding Fathers and Patriots won their freedom, they wanted just a wee bit more and took over what is now the United States of America from coast to coast. Thing is, Britain was also still there in a land known as Canada, or actually British North America, or Rupert's Land if you went to Canadian history class. The British were doing the same thing and expanding westward. They both got to the Pacific West Coast and everything was cool, kosher, great. Well, except for some islands not too far from the mainland. It was heavily debated on who actually owned these islands. 
Well, it almost turned into another global war. Both Americans and British were living on the island. When a British owned pig had gone one step too far and eaten out of an American field, the pig paid the price with his life. Causing tensions to escalate to the point where the Navy and high ranking officers got involved. Ooh, not good. Partially being stoked by an American who to this day, no one knows the method to his madness. But apparently he was looking for a fight regardless. Kind of a weird story. All over a pig. Jeez. Number 9. The Anglo-Zanzibar War One day a disgruntled nephew got rid of his uncle and took the Zanzibar throne for his own. Classic story when it comes to royals, that's what they do. Naturally the British who said dibs on Zanzibar were not all too pleased, as they had someone else in mind for the throne. Someone who would let them in and keep empiring as they do. So this angry nephew said, nah I don't think so fam. Ain't have a not. And he started to organize the troops. And in a nutshell, said, You know what? Why don't you come on in and try and stop me? You and one army. Well, it was the British Army. They did, and it's been recorded as the shortest conflict in human history, lasting only 45 minutes. The nephew escaped to the German embassy, and the British moved in. The rest is colonial history. What a great story. Number eight, the football war. It started with the leaders of Honduras and El Salvador. There was some agriculture and land disputes growing and the leader of Honduras made it worse by using El Salvador migrants as scapegoats for their problems. Classic dictator move, am I right? Come on. Tensions kept getting hotter to the point where people were being treated differently and that's not good. And because history is a funny thing, the 1970 World Cup at the time was going to be played by the both feuding nations. The passion, the rage, the anger, the music, they got good music down there, was poured into that game. Well, it was enough for El Salvador to cut all diplomatic ties and after the game, declare war outside of the soccer stadium. For real. People got hurt. It wasn't good. Man, that's rough. Number seven, the Emu War. Say what you will about country folk, but when small town folks band together as one, anything can be accomplished. Well, let's take a trip down under so I can talk about the Emu War. The Great Depression was tough. That was the case for Australian farmers. It was actually a little extra hard for them too. Unfortunately for the farmers, they also had an emu problem. Large birds eating and destroying their crops. I mean, they're massive. You see an emu, they're like, they're like this big, they're huge. The government in all her powerful glory decided to step in and lend a hand. They sent out soldiers with trucks and machine blam blam. So obviously, the people got rid of the emus, right? It makes sense. There's this armies here, we're gonna get rid of them, no problem. Well, no. What should have been an easy work unfolded into the emu war. Weeks of trying to hunt down the pesky emus it was somewhat ineffective. One politician joked that emus should be awarded medals for their bravery in standing up to the soldiers. That's just crazy. That's just, well. Number six, World War One. While there are many factors that led to World War I, and some that you might not hear in the classroom, but in a nutshell, new technology, militarism, imperialism, and a general distaste for each other were all thrown into a pot. She was turned on high, and when Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo, she was turned on high, really hot, when Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo. A lot of people will tell you that's where it started, and they're not wrong. However, there was a lot of miscommunication and correspondence that had to happen between the empires first. In a series of very tragic events, leaders were on vacation, didn't get messages, people sat on war declarations, and before peace could be made, people were pointing fingers and playing the blame game, which is pretty much what got boots on the ground and or to the grounds. Wasn't good. So in a nutshell, World War I was started by miscommunication. That's kind of awkward. Number five, World War II. Well, surely after the most destructive conflict in human history, we wouldn't be so keen on another, right? Well, wrong. That could be the point right there. But the unusual event that started World War II was nothing. Just like that episode of Seinfeld. It, it was a war about nothing, George. I don't know. Well, not true, but let me explain. The factors leading up to World War II were all there. Fascism, communism, imperial expansion, again. Revenge, unification, however, honestly like a bunch of bad parents letting their kids get away with anything, nobody really did anything to stop Mustache Man. They used a policy called appeasement, which basically meant he wants something, he gets it. He wants something, he gets it. Not a great, not a great system. Okay, you can have that country, but no more. That's it, we appeased you enough. Oh, okay, you can have that one, but next time, no more. That's it, for real. Oh, fine, you can have that one too, but now I'm putting my foot down. And after four or five countries fell to Mustache Man, that's when they finally did something. So really, it was neglect. Number four, Jenkins' ear. 1731, Britain. 
They were looking for an excuse to attack Spain. After all, they've got a lot of loot and gold, and come on, that belongs to Britain. It's gonna go in our museum, come on, that makes sense. They had just about run out of hope until Jenkins walked into the room. Sounds like a joke, but it's true. Jenkins was an English sailor who had gotten into a confrontation with Spanish authorities eight years prior. Sadly for Jenkins, it cost him his ear. They, they took off his ear, because that's what, that's what you do back then. And as soon as the British caught wind of his ear, well, huh, it was on. So yes, they did start a war over a man's missing ear, because it's a good reason to steal gold. Number three, the War of the Bucket. Modena and Bologna, two warring Italian city-states. One sponsored by the big man in the big hat, which is the Pope, as they call him, I think. And the other was the Holy Roman Emperor. Big power struggle, who's, who's in charge? I don't know. This was kind of the way it went in ye olde medieval Europe. However, in 1325, it began to get a little spicy, as both Medina and Bologna would make a day out of raiding each other's cities, because even though we're pretty similar, we'll just attack each other, because yeah, sure. However, it got real serious when Bologna's bucket went missing. Oh. It started a war, and the real ironic thing is it might not have been stolen at all and just blamed in confusion of a missing bucket. Medina steals a bucket, we gotta get him. How dare you take my bucket? It's kinda like when your sibling takes your favorite toy. You did what to my action figure? You know what I mean? Number two, the console war. My generation probably remembers the PS3 versus Xbox 360 war. I'm pretty sure Chris remembers that, he does. But the real one was Sega versus Nintendo in the 90s. Well, how did it start? Okay, well, Nintendo was on a huge roll. Super Mario, Metroid, Zelda, you couldn't stop them. That was until the Sega Genesis released with the edgiest blue hedgehog ever to grace your old TVs. Millions of dollars in smear campaigns, Genesis does what Nintendo doesn't. I'm sure you guys all remember. That, that commercial, it was a really powerful commercial. I, I, I learned about it in, 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 in business class, so there you go, look at that. And number one, the Russo-Japanese War. This one's crazy. How about a war, cause it'll make us look cool, said the advisors to Tsar Nicholas II, worried the Russian Empire didn't look so cool anymore cause it's been failing for a while. And in a classic schoolyard tactic, let's find the weakest link and start there. Well, they thought it was Japan, but as it turns out, Japan wasn't that guy, pal. He's not that guy, pal. And they won, so very su surprising literally everyone. So not only did a massive European power start a conflict with a puny island nation for bragging rights, but they also lost that war to a puny island nation for bragging rights. That's just crazy. Number 10, Japanese holdouts. September 2nd, 1945, World War II had come to an end as the Japanese forces officially surrendered well, that's awesome, right? Time to go on vacation, honey. Say, those Pacific Islands look beautiful this time of year. Well, especially when we're not being shot at. They look a lot better then. Sounds great, right? I know. Well, I'd be careful where you go. As when night falls on the islands, you can never be too sure what lurks in the brush. That includes soldiers of the Japanese Empire still fighting World War II on their own terms. That's right, Japan went on the defensive after the Battle of Midway during World War II, occupying every island in the Pacific to slow down the Allies. Now, you mix in being dug into those islands for years with an unrelenting dedication to the Emperor, thank you very much, and you get yourself some soldiers who just won't quit. Years after World War II ended, a handful of dudes who had finally come to realize that it was all over finally surrendered. However, some soldiers stayed in hiding for up to almost 30 years. They thought they were fighting World War II for 30 years. That is insane. Number nine, Mad Jack Churchill. With the way Hollywood works, I'm more surprised this guy hasn't gotten a movie made about him. Seriously, look this guy up. You won't believe it. However, what I can say is I'm glad he was on our side, and I am very sure of that. Mad Jack Churchill was a British commando who was more known for his use of medieval tactics well, because he liked to use a longbow and a broadsword uh, for battle, which I, I can't even tell you how messed up that is. I can only imagine the fear in the German's eyes when a man cometh marching over a hill, playing Scotland the Brave, wielding a broadsword and charging at full speed. <sighs> Jack was captured, escaped, captured again, and after he and some other POWs dug their way to a prison, he then walked hundreds of miles to the Allies in Italy. That is a, that's just a crazy story. Where is that man's story? And coming over to the, you know, playing Scotland the Brave, that's crazy, man. That's insane. I, I like that, oh, I like that song. That's a good song choice if I've ever heard that. 
Number eight, Desmond Doss. Besides having a name that really sounds cool, Desmond is a man with a unique experience. When you think of war, it's guy with gun go boom, right? Makes sense, sure. Well, not according to Desmond. He walked into battle as a combat medic without a firearm. Yes. Nothing to defend himself with. I know, he's crazy, right? I know. Crazy enough to earn himself the Medal of Honor, which usually isn't earned whilst you're still alive. Usually earned after you, you don't make it. His valor was proven in Okinawa and Hacksaw Ridge, good movie, go see it, where he helped carry injured men back from the line and literally saved their lives. All while under the threat of enemy attack and sharpshooters. Over his life-saving career, he would save up to 100 lives and a few more. He even saved some enemy lives. A shining light in pure darkness. Number 7, Second Son. Sutomo Yamaguchi is a very lucky man. Folks, after hearing about this one, I would go and buy a lottery ticket. Seriously, you may win after this. Pretty lucky. Okay, so Mr. Yamaguchi was on a business trip in Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945. He was set to return to his home in Nagasaki when an American B-52 bomber dropped its payload on the city. And this was the big bad one. Miraculously, Mr. Yamaguchi, after being blown off his feet and receiving cuts and radiation burns, was still alive. He rested at a shelter and then returned home. On August 9th, he was explaining what had happened to him three days prior when another large flash of light and explosion went off. This was the other big one. It left him deaf in one ear, but he was further away from ground zero the second time. But yes, this is a man who survived both atomic devices. He lived all the way up until his 90s. Very impressive. Number six, escaping to South America. This is one of the reasons I have an issue with the Disney Star Wars movies. Hang in there, trust me. After Darth Vader destroys the Sith with the love of his son and the Emperor takes a dive into the exploding Death Star 2 reactor, oh no, not another dive in the reactor. Most people think it's all over, but what about the countless other Imperials, thousands of stormtroopers and star destroyers? For the Disney movie, they pretty much just updated the look and said, yeah, they're back, they're, they're back now. But I need more details, baby. Speaking of details, how did high-ranking Germans escape to South America after World War II ended? Hmm, yes, thought-provoking, isn't it? Well, that's right, they did. The answer, though, is a network of rat lines. Germany 1945 had an issue. If you look to your left, there was a coalition force of armies coming their way, singing Yankee Doodle Dandy all the way to Berlin. On their right was an army bent on revenge, singing a much more heinous version of Yankee Doodle Dandy all the way to Berlin. So the Germans grabbed their schnitzel and sauerkraut to go and de-assed the area. Trouble is, the guys who were escaping were the worst of the worst. We weren't talking about any grandpas or opas here. These, these guys are pretty bad. Ones responsible for very horrible things. Some were caught, but sadly, others were not. Josef Mengele comes to mind. Google him, not nice. Number five, the Bataan March. The Bataan March is very similar to the beep test. Or imagine track and field in school, except instead of teachers forcing you to compete in events not designed around your body type, thanks, you're a soldier and the Imperial Japanese Army is making you march miles in the brutal sun. And some people with no shoes on, who often get berated and tormented. Okay, I guess the two aren't very similar at all, but you get the point. All you need to know is that some POWs took a very long walk and a lot of these POWs, for sure, were not supposed to be treated that way. It was, it was really bad, actually. Did not make it to the destination at all. MacArthur said he was coming back after this, and boy did he. Ooh, he came back with a vengeance. Number four, veterans. This one is a broad stroke, but I think it fits the bill here. Pretty accurately, actually. This goes out to all veterans of the Second World War. Folks at home, you might have to show them this because I can imagine they're a little bit older and probably not too familiar with YouTube, but thank you. To all the men and women out there who did their part and paid a bill that I know I never could. The closest I ever want to be to a battlefield is, well, Battlefield or Call of Duty. From the campaigns in Africa, Italy, France, and pushing all the way into Germany as well as the brave fighting in the Pacific. I remember, and I for one am very thankful. You don't need to tell me how hard it was to survive or the fight when you came back home. A little a wholesome point there, I, I love that. You guys are great, thank you very much. Number three, Bob Hoover, the pilot's pilot. You gotta respect the style of Bob Hoover. Okay, so let's say you spend a year in a German POW camp. You make for your escape, except now what? If it's early 1940s like Bob Hoover found himself in, not a lot of Germanless areas uh, to be in. Well, Bob Hoover knew he needed to say Auf Wiedersehen and get the heck out of there. Bob Hoover did not walk, however. No, 
He did something much cooler. Kind of like when you hijack your first Banshee in Halo 3. Yeah, same thing and same feeling. Bob, being the excellent pilot he was, managed to steal a German plane and flew back to safety, where he linked up with some British allies in the area. How James Bond of you, sir. Oh, yes, I love it. Number two, Ivan Chizov. Another airplane story, but gosh darn, this one is uh, really impressive. Ivan Chizov was a Russian fighter pilot who was having some plane troubles. And by plane troubles, I mean it was going to crash. So yeah, not good. The man knew he had to eject, but the troublesome German planes around him, and the German planes being known for shooting at parachuters, well, he knew he had to make a five head play. He said, I'll just wait till I'm below the ensuing air battle, and then I'll pull my parachute. Well, sadly, he waited too long, and his chute didn't open. He fell 5,000 meters to the ground, and lived. He lived. I, I, Poor Ivan did sustain some serious injuries, but like a miracle, got the medical attention he needed and asked to join back in the fight only three months later. That's just kind of crazy. 5,000 meters and he lived? How? Number one, German summer camp. I promise it's not going where you think it's going. The international community had an idea of what Germany was up to during the years before World War II, but no one really knew for sure. When allies moved into occupied Europe, it was clear some people were gonna have some explaining to do, okay? You just can't do this, guy. You can't do that, man. You can't do that. But you guys knew that. It was awful and it should never happen again. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. However, today the worst camp I want to talk about is their youth program. Mustache Man was trying to build a better Germany. If he started with the youngins, the camp was designed like many today to give young folks something to do, to educate them, keep them occupied, or in my mom's case, uh, some peace and quiet during the summer. Well, at this camp, it wasn't bonfires and swimming. It was all kinds of nasty things you two probably won't let me say. But what I can tell you is that it was a brainwashing effort to get everyone in support of their not so glorious leader. Kicking off the list at number 10, Goose Green Battle. Although the British were taking on large numbers of Argentinian soldiers, their unit, outnumbered, still came out on top. The Battle of Goose Green took place on May 28th and May 29th, 1982. It ended with over 900 Argentine soldiers surrendering. It was a rocky start to the operation, to say the least. Argentinian forces were ready when the British arrived. The main assault force was the 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment, led by Lieutenant Colonel Herbert Jones, but BBC Radio straight up spoiled the surprise initially. At the time, they were broadcasting news, as was happening, of the Goose Green attack. The Argentinian forces were tipped off, and then when the attack was finally underway come the morning of May 28th, Jones sadly lost his life, heroically charging at the enemy post. The Argentinian garrison formally surrendered the following morning, and the late Herbert Jones received, as well as his successor of the battalion, Major Chris Keeble, they were both awarded medals. Jones received the Victoria Cross, while Keeble received the Distinguished Service Order. Two para were outnumbered and should have lost when comparing support, but they ended up taking down the entire Argentine garrison, more than twice their own size. Number 9. Bluff Cove on June 8, 1982, British troop transport ships were attacked from the skies. Argentine air forces took the lives of 56 soldiers and wounding 150. British troops were in the middle of unloading when two waves of A-4 Skyhawks from Argentine's 5th Air Brigade attacked. The Skyhawks departed from Rio Gallegos Air Base and originally eight of them were on the way, but three had to turn back due to refueling issues. With warning signals not reaching Bluff Cove, around 2 p.m. local time, the first strike hit two ships, the RFA Tristam and the RFA Sir Galahad. At 4.50 p.m. local time, the second strike hit. This one sank an LSU from HMS Fearless. Number 8. The HMS Plymouth just because an explosive is a dud does not mean that it's not going to set everything ablaze. The HMS Plymouth is a Rothsay class frigate named of course after the English city and it served the United Kingdom's Royal Navy from 1959 to 1988. This warship has since been decommissioned and opened to the public but finally scrapped in 2014. The HMS Plymouth was one of the first Royal Navy ships to arrive in the South Atlantic once Argentine forces invaded the Falkland Islands. Plymouth, the Antrim, Brilliant, and Endurance all combined forces to recapture South Georgia on April 28th. This was Operation Paraket. On June 8th, during the Bluff Cove air attack, Plymouth was hit from the skies, but the four explosions did not go off. They were all duds. One of them ended up hitting the flight deck, detonating a depth charge, and a fire broke out, but none of them really went off. You know what I'm saying? Five men were injured on the Plymouth, but later on in the wardroom of the ship was where the surrender of the Argentine forces was signed by Lieutenant Commander Alfredo Astiz. So there's a lot of history in that one ship. Number seven, Battle of Mount Harriet. 
Taking place in the late hours of June 11th, 1982, the Battle of Mount Harriet is one of the three main battles that took place during the Falklands War. And they happened all on the same night. I keep saying the dates also just to really drive that information into your head, but these operations went down roughly at the same exact time. The British had 42 commando, Royal Marines, artillery support from a battery of 29 commando regiment, and Royal Artillery. British war correspondent John Witherow recalls the naval support at the Battle of Mount Harriet as blistering. Here's a quote from Witherow on the evening of June 11th, 1982. We were involved with one night attack on Mount Harriet when the Welsh's guards were coming up as backup. This involved marching for several hours on a very dark night through a minefield. Sporadic shell fire slowed our progress tremendously and eventually we made a base out of Mount Harriet, which was coming under incredible fire from a frigate offshore. The whole mountain seemed to erupt in flame. It seemed impossible that anybody could survive an attack like that. And this went on for well over an hour, just shell after shell whistling over our heads and hitting the mountain. Eventually this was lifted and Marines went in. And to our amazement, there seemed to be an incredible amount of fighting going on. There was a lot of tracer fire. The whole night was being lit up by flares, which cast a dead, unrealistic pall over the whole scene." End quote. 26 soldiers were wounded, and both Corporal Lawrence G. Watts and Acting Corporal Jeremy Smith lost their lives in the Battle of Mount Harriet. Number six, Mount Longdon. One of the most violent firefights of the Falklands War was the Battle of Mount Longdon. The night of June 11th, 1982, many recall as one of the most horrifying. 23 members of the Parachute Regiment lost their lives, while 47 others were injured. Veteran James O'Connell was 22 years old at the time. He recalls being at death's door. I had dressings covering my face to stop the blood, and I remember being loaded onto a stretcher. I heard one of the guys carry me saying, this one's alive, and the other say, is he? Well, let's take him back then. There was a makeshift mortuary, and I think I was being taken there to be placed with the dead." End quote. He was literally on his way. I can't imagine what that feels like in numerous ways. O'Connell was hit in the head and face. A bullet went through his nose and right eye. It just went through his cheekbone entirely. And on top of that, they couldn't even get helicopters to Mount Longdon for 12 hours. So O'Connell, as well as many others injured, had to just wait it out. The British forces consisted of 3rd Battalion, artillery support from 29 Commando Regiment, Royal Artillery, Parachute Regiment 3 Para under Lieutenant Colonel Hugh Pike. Number five. Battle of Two Sisters. The third battle that took place on the night of June 11th was the Battle of Two Sisters. This battle, as well as Mount Harriet and Mount Longdon, were brigade-sized operations that all happened, remind you, on the same night. The British were commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Whitehead, and the support consisted of Royal Marines of 45 Commando, the anti-tank troop from 40 Commando, with support from 29 Commando Regiment, and naval support from the HMM Glamoran. Originally, 45 Commando was to seize Two Sisters Mountain overnight, hiding in the darkness, and if there was enough time, use said darkness to advance onto Tumble Down Mountain. Argentine forces were ready, so the second phase of the attack was unable to happen as they wanted to. In total, 22 British soldiers lost their lives, a destroyer was hit, as well as three helicopters. 22 were killed, with 47 wounded. Number four, friendly fire. On the 6th of June, 1982, an incident occurred which claimed the lives of four British soldiers. Navy destroyer HMS Cardiff destroyed the friendly Gazelle helicopter. So what happened? How does something like this happen in the first place? Well, the HMS Cardiff was on lookout for Argentinian forces. Supplies coming into the Falklands Islands, is, of course, is a no-go. So on the night of June 5th, HMS Cardiff was stationed east of the islands, and at 2 a.m. they detected the British Gazelle helicopter, thinking that it was an attack. The helicopter was actually making a routine delivery with both equipment and soldiers on board. So what went wrong here? Well, first, after the Sea Dart missile was fired, the next morning it was assumed enemy fire was initially responsible. The Ministry of Defense stated they didn't want to cause further anguish to relatives while they were trying to piece together what went wrong. So it was a lot happening in one night. So some articles made it sound like they tried to hide it. It was really just they had their hands full and it was an accident. A lack of communication between the Army and the Navy was to blame, but not one individual per se, confirms the Board of Inquiry. The 5th Infantry Brigade had not notified anybody of the helicopter's flight, so it was a surprise to many, especially coming in at that speed to that location. The radar also doesn't look good at 2am when you see that blip coming in. And on top of that, the helicopter's identification friend or foe transmitter, the IFF, it was turned off at this point because it had previously interfered with the Army's anti-aircraft system. So it was just an accident. Number three, HMS Sheffield. The Type 42 guided missile destroyer was the second Royal Navy ship to be named after the city of Sheffield, Yorkshire. In response to the Argentine invasion, Sheffield was sent to retake the islands on April 2nd, 1982. Captain Salt had ordered the ship to change course every 90 seconds to avoid submarine threat. The two weeks prior to the attack, Argentine forces were training against their own ships, which happened to include Type 42 destroyers, the same class as the HMS Sheffield. So they knew the radar detection distances and the reaction times like the back of their hand at this point. 
They used a technique called pecking the lobes, which meant that they would avoid detection by flying on the side of the emitting radar, out of sight. The destroyer was hit on May 4th and foundered while under tow six days later on May 10th. Number two, the Battle of Seal Cove. Just west of Lively Island during the Falklands War, the Battle of Seal Cove was also underway. On May 22, the British frigates HMS Brilliant and HMS Yarmouth were supporting Operation Sutton. This was happening right off of San Carlos Bay when they received orders to stop and take over an Argentinian coastal supply boat, the ARA Monsoonan. It was a 326 ton British coaster that had previously been owned by the Falkland Islands Company, but during the invasions, the ship was captured. It was also loaded with 150 drums of fuel and 250 sacks of flour. The HMS Yarmouth opened fire and forced that vessel to beach on Seal Cove. And finally coming in at number one, young soldiers. It's important to remember how young these brave soldiers were at the time. I wanted to finish this list off by sharing the words of a Royal Navy veteran who was only a teenager during the Falklands War. Craig Mac McDermott was 17 at the time. Craig was on the HMS Antrim in 1982 when conflict took off. The actual location of the Falkland Islands is different than most expect. Craig explains his initial thoughts at the time. He shared this in the Daily Record last November. When I first heard of the Falkland Islands, like many people, I thought they were just off the north of Scotland. I didn't know where they were, but there is no way I will ever forget them after everything I've witnessed. We were naive and too young to understand the severity of what we were about to encounter. The air attacks were constant and there were several injured during each of the attacks. The suffering was indescribable and something that I'll never be able to forget. Thank you for your service, Craig. During the Cold War. Number 10, the Cold War. Some of our viewers may have lived through the times classified as the Cold War, but let me clarify for anyone who doesn't know or was too deep into hippie culture to remember what the heck was going on. And honestly, it's pretty messed up. So in a nutshell, after World War II ended, Germany was split into two. One side, capitalist allies, the other, communist Soviet Union. Russia was an ally during World War II, but this relationship quickly deteriorated. The two political and economic ideologies would grow distaste for one another and would compete politically, economically, and most fearfully with their militaries. The United States being the superpower on the one side and the Soviet Union on the other. They spread their views, a lot of times by force, until almost the entire world was divided by the two styles of government, lasting from 1945 all the way up until MTV was still good, around the mid-90s when the Soviet Union was dissolved. That's a lot of history to unpack here, so I'm gonna do my best to tell you some crazy facts and to make you laugh. I'm a comedian, it's what I do. Number nine, Charlie in the Trees. We've talked about Vietnam a few times on this channel, but I can't stress this enough. It was messed up for many people, Americans and Vietnamese alike. As a Canadian, we mostly dodged that hairy situation. While the Vietnam War was America's worst war since World War II, and the most costly in terms of lives and budget, it was not the only conflict. Vietnam was probably the hottest war of the Cold War, but there's many other little things that make this such an interesting time. France had spent years trying to reclaim their colony, and with no luck, America being there for a total legit reason of containment also didn't have much luck, especially after 1968. Refer to our Vietnamese war videos, they're pretty good. Lives lost, lessons learned, and hopefully somebody found Charlie. I swear, in every movie they're always looking for a guy named Charlie. I guess we never find him, I don't know. Number eight, the name's Bond, James Bond. It would be difficult to talk about the Cold War without talking about espionage and spies. While not to the exaggerated level the 007 series likes to take things with its, well, little people and lethal hat throwing, there was still, however, a ton of black ops going on behind the scenes. You only have to look at the superpower spy agencies, the CIA and the KGB. Both agencies went on globe-trotting clandestine operations to gather information, sabotage, and just about anything else James Bond would do. Stealth, spy gadgets, and missions to save the world. All martini shaken, of course, not stirred. Just like Bond, except the whole womanizing thing. Or maybe there was, as the Soviets would often use women's alluring good looks to produce results they so wished for. Ah yes, thanks to beautiful female agents sleeping a lot, uh, thank you. We now know we are one step closer to discovering the Colonel's secret herbs and spices. Our chicken shall have flavor soon. Number seven, Fallout. Probably the heaviest underlying theme of the Cold War was the constant and looming threat of nuclear annihilation. The US got smart in the end of 1945 and developed and used the world's first atomic bombs. This was great for America, not so great for Japan. America was feeling mighty high. That was until the Soviet Union developed their own shortly after. Now it wasn't so cool anymore. 
Both sides were worried that further escalation of any issue in the Cold War would lead to mutually assured destruction, rendering the bombs the most destructive weapon on Earth and also the most useless. And to be fair, there was a good chance of that happening. There were multiple instances of escalation where the world watched on as the two superpowers were about to end it all. Finna act up because they wanted their politics to be number one. I'm a act up. Number six, space race. No, the space race is not a race on how many special brownies that you can eat and see how fast it takes you to space out. Remember grade 10, right? I know. What it actually was, was a race to see who could develop the best and fastest space age technology and advancements. Which, if you study economics, could be a good thing. Healthy competition driven by new technology. In reality, it kind of sucked though. In the 1950s, Russia launched the first satellite, the Sputnik. Which to America was scary because it's America, we never lost anything. The Soviet Union would follow up with the first animal in space and then the first man. Some experiments unfortunately never made it back in one piece. America then trumped them back by landing on the moon. Now what's so messed up? Well, for the Soviet Union, this began to put a severe dent in their economy. All the spending on space and military was having an effect on their people. In a nutshell, it made them broke. And if you want to figure out what style of government is better, well, the US has Las Vegas, Russia has beets, and turnips, and depressed artists. Number five, the Korean War. A war that is frankly just not talked about enough, and sadly, I feel like the veterans don't get enough praise, so thank you. Now, back to the mildly funny content. Korea was finding itself in quite a pickle. The same pickle that 40 other nations throughout the Cold War would find themselves in. Capitalism and communism were going to have a fight. A fight in their backyard. And it was going to be costly. Both sides supported their own not so nice dictator and a bloody conflict ensued. Despite the UN and US efforts and despite the Chinese and Soviet efforts, things kind of ended in the worst stalemate ever. As even today the tensions exist, Korea remains split in two by the ideologies. And North Korea is still a little crazy. Just a little bit. Number four, up, up, and away. Back when history's second favorite mustache man, Sosef Jolin, was in charge, things were kind of oppressive. They were just really oppressive, actually. It, it, it was bad. Where were the Karens when we needed them to stand up to the actual oppression? When Germany was split into cool and not so cool Germany, the division between its citizens was becoming clear, and the people on the capitalist side were just living better, as life is better when you can walk into a German 7-Eleven and purchase a Slim Jim, cigarettes, Mountain Dew, and a reputable magazine with lewd centerfolds. You know the one. So Mustache Man feeling confident after getting rid of history's favorite Mustache Man blocked roads and trains from Berlin in hopes that the West would give in to his demands. And in pure teenage defiance, the West began to fly in supplies daily. 12,000 tons of goods daily. That's a lot of centerfolds, my guy. Number three, the man who saved the world. Vasily Arkhipov, not a name I reckon my humble bumblebees are familiar with. Well, why is this man so important? He's one of the reasons why you're not watching this video from the comfort of a concrete bunker. During the totally non-controversial Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a Russian submarine with a Russian submarine commander. All of Sean Connery jokes aside, the sub had nuclear capabilities. What's even scarier than that is due to some rising tensions and miscommunication, the bane of every good relationship, three out of four keys had been turned and were waiting on Vasily's response. Those were keys to launch nukes, by the way. Maybe it was his bleeding Russian heart, or a strong will to save mankind. Or it could have been nuclear radiation warping his brain and body due to a previous mishap on the sub. But regardless, he said nay, and the nuclear war was avoided. Thank goodness. I hope that never happens again. Whew. Number two, Broken Arrow. What is scarier than the uncertain destruction of society as we know it? And trust me, nuclear fire would be a bad way to go. I don't want to grow another third arm. The first one was difficult to get rid of. Well, how about not knowing at all where the bombs are? Sure, you wouldn't really see one until there was a mushroom cloud over your favorite vegan restaurant, and by then it would just be too late. But what I'm talking about is devices that got lost in the mail, or just lost by the military. And yes, it's happened multiple times through the decades. One incident where a device was lost from a crash plane, and three out of the four safeties had been failed. That's a little too close for comfort. But of the declassified incidents the US is willing to tell you about, the Soviet Union has never said how many they lost. Just one of those comforting facts to keep both sides of your pillow warm at night. Number one, happy ending. 
There were tons of things to talk about during the Cold War. Seriously, you need a historian and a few textbooks to break everything down. However, when you boil down the main events, what was it really for? All that tension and stress. Nuclear war is just on the horizon. Years of arms racing and flinging people into the atmosphere faster than you can say, look out Ukraine. A lot of things changed and a lot didn't. To me, it just seems like it's such a waste of money and time to have all those world enders collecting dust somewhere under an onion shaped building. Russia has some onion shaped buildings. I, I'm just assuming that's, that's where they are. I'm hungry at this point. The point I'm making is let's keep the nuking to the fat man and fall out the video game. Not real life. Let's just be peaceful. <laughs> Number 10, Battle of LA. Remember the 1940s? Okay, well, maybe not. I mean, if you did, then you might not be watching this video, or you would need assistance from a strapping young grandson, such as myself, to help you with searching on the internet and whatnot. It's okay, I, I help the old people, I, I, that's what I do. Well, for the folks that didn't know, the world was at war, and passions were a little high. America, in a nutshell, said they weren't getting involved the second time around until Japan came, well, they kicked their sandcastle over. And by sandbox, I mean they made Pearl Harbor go boom. So naturally, a few months after the Pearl Harbor incident in February of 1942, the lovely west coast city of LA was put into shock and horror when unidentified flying objects appeared in the night sky. Air raid sirens blared and anti-aircraft artillery began to light up the night sky, as this was suspected to be a Japanese invasion. Well, it wasn't actually, it was actually a, a false alarm, so no need to panic, right? <laughs> Maybe. Number 9. The Chosen Few in the beginning of the Cold War, it was clear that the West had some spooky, scary communist enemies to deal with. And almost immediately after the world had sent Germany packing, the Soviet Union was acting up. And then China, uh, and then Korea. Well, that was it. We had had it. The West and America had enough of communism spreading. It was time to contain it. So American and UN forces went to Korea to have a discussion at the 38th parallel. One group of Marines at the Chosen Valley had a chewy perspective of the event. When this group of Marines at Chosen Valley radioed in for a supply drop, they used the code word Tootsie Rolls as it was a code for mortar shells that they so desperately needed. Well, apparently the radio operator didn't get the memo and had an actual crate of Halloween's second least favorite candy scent. Besides candy corn, no one likes that stuff. But being the Marines, they used it to their advantage. And after being chewed up and placed over holes and gaps, the chocolatey treat made for a great filler, especially after freezing in the freezing cold weather at Chosen Valley. Cool story. Number eight, Jenkins Ear. The best way to describe life in the new world in the 18th century is aggressive corporate negotiations. The new world was full of plantations, trade, and YouTube's least favorite S word. So, also naturally, the British Empire and its Royal Majesty wanted a slice of the Caribbean action. Trouble is, the Spanish had been there longer, and at the time, their presence was much more powerful. Well, the British had the means to despanify the area, and all they really needed was a reason, because, you know, that makes war more palatable, right? Sure. Well, that's when they were presented with Robert Jenkins, a man who had his ear cut off by a bunch of Spanish thugs who raided his ship years prior. Turns out this was enough cozy belly to start a war and fight over an ear. Hence the name in English, the war became the Battle of Jenkins' Ear. That's so weird. That's so strange. Imagine a guy, right, he's got his ear lobbed off. It's on to go. Let's go. I guess that's a reason. Sure. Well, how long ago did this happen? Oh, it was like 10 years ago. Right, good enough for us. Get back in. Number seven, Charge at Creasy. The Charge at Creasy can be described as a Hail Mary. One final push. The last card. It's a 1v6 and search and destroy on high rise in modern warfare, too. Bottom of the ninth and bases are loaded. If Hollywood has taught us anything in life, it's that these events always work out for our hero. Well, sometimes real life isn't like Hollywood movies. Take John of Bohemia, for instance, your classic 1300s guy. Marrying his way into royalty, a warrior, a knight. Except poor John was blind in one eye due to a medical condition. Poor John. Well, at the Battle of Creasy, his bravery was put on full display. John had his horses tethered to other knights, because he was blind, as they made their last effort dash into the enemy, or charge, if you will. They, they didn't make it. It didn't work out. Kind of crazy, like, right, I'm blind, and what I'm going to do is, I'm going to tie your horse to my horse, and we're going to run straight at the enemy. 
Number 6. Napoleon in Moscow During the Corsican Ogre's European tour, he let himself into Russia. More specifically, he made it all the way to Moscow. Uh oh. This was impressive for a couple of reasons. One, because he had defeated other European powers with really little effort and he was about to defeat Russia. Finger quotes about to defeat Russia. Back in the day, there was this notion that if you control the nation's capital, you win. Well, he had Moscow, but it was more of a Pyrrhic victory. Russia had enacted a military tactic called Scorched Earth, and it wouldn't be the last time they used it. Basically, back in the day, militaries relied heavily on the lands they took for resources, food, shelter, and supply lines. Well, you can't control that if there's no land to take. So Russia destroyed their land, food, fields, and really anything that would have been helpful along the way as they retreated. Also, the winters were very brutal and cold, and the French were not prepared. So mix that together, and uh-oh, awkward. Number five, the Battle of Mogadishu. Here's a modern one for you. It was a simple job. Grab two high-value targets, known collaborators of a corrupt Somali leader who's basically just a dictator. Things were going great until two $6 million Black Hawk helicopters were downed by enemies on the ground. An in-and-out operation that was supposed to last no longer than an hour. Tops, I swear, I promise. It actually turned out to be an overnight 16 hour rescue op that saw 18 Americans lose their life, known as the Black Hawk Down situation, or operation I guess. So what's the lesson on this one? I, well, I'm not really sure to be honest, but what I do know is that it left the mark on 90s history and American military snafus. Uh oh. <laughs> Number 4, Castle Itter. Okay, good guys wear one outfit, bad guys wear another. If the soldier in front of you sounds German and it's World War II, then it's probably the enemy. Chances are. It all makes sense, right? Well, the Battle of Castle Itter makes no sense. When World War II was coming to its climactic close, Americans and Allied forces were coming from the west, and all of Mother Russia was coming from the east. A lot of Germans fought to the bitter end, but the smart ones knew it was time to jump ship. You can see it was falling apart. And in the case of Castle Inner, they actually joined forces with Americans and allies to defend high value prisoners from an SS detachment who still thought Germany could win. Spoiler alert, they could not win. It was over. And the joint force would see a victory. That's kind of cool. That's a cool story. I, again, where's the movie of that? Where's the movie? Put me in the movie. Someone made me famous. Let's go. Hollywood directors, I'm talking to you. Number three, Sterling Bridge. There was one time growing up I had a super important test to take at school. I don't remember what class it was, but I remember studying extra hard for it. I mean seriously, I opened the books and I hit them hard, brother. Harder than my little heart could desire. I studied my little heart out. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was really hard, correct? And now I'm thinking about it, it's probably math. Anyway, well, when I went to bed, I knew that I was going to be ready for that test. The trouble is, I woke up at 9.57. School started at 8.30. Not only did I miss the test, but when I retook it, I didn't do as well as I thought. Well, this is the case of the Battle of Sterling Bridge, except there wasn't really any awkward high school stuff going on. It was just more of a serious battle for independence. The very famous William Wallace and the Scottish were at odds with the English, as you'll find in history they do that. Well, that morning the British general slept in, and Wallace, seeing an opportunity, seized it. And seized the day and victory for Scotland. The lesson here? Set your alarm, folks. Don't miss the battle. Set your alarm. Number two, Operation Cottage. Canada and the US have been friends for a very long time, and we will probably be friends for a very long time. We have apologized profusely for burning down the White House. We're sorry, eh? Didn't mean to do that, bud. I'm sorry there, guy. Right? Sorry, friend. Jeez. However, did you know that in a classic World War II military snafu, Canadians and US soldiers fought each other? Kiska Island, Alaska, it had been occupied by a small group of Japanese forces, which is kind of a weird story on its own. How did that even happen? So we went to go kindly ask them to leave, as you do. Trouble is, when we got there, there were no Japanese, and in a very confusing battle after landing on two different points of the island, our two great nations fought each other, where sadly lives were lost. It was rough. It was sad. There was like, it was like 30 Americans and like 4 Canadians. I don't know if we're just good shots or what. I don't know what it is, buddy. Number 1. Bull Run. 
The Civil War. It's the one that shaped America. Brother versus brother. And it's what your dad reads about in his spare time. I don't know. We, dad just do that. Bull Run is one of the most famous battles from the time. However, I don't want to focus on the battle itself as I've nerded out too hard in history already today in this video. No! Why am I talking about this and why is this in the number one spot? Well, that's because of spectators. Yes, that's right, spectators. Wealthy folks would often come to large battles like Bull Run on a disadvantage point out of the splash zone, literally, and view the ensuing horror that was the Civil War. And before you even ask, yes, they brought food and a picnic to enjoy the show. Maybe don't watch that. Just an idea. Next time. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. oh well. Yeah.